Coming up next, we'll hear about a new report on adapting our societies about uh, the effects of climate change. First, though, it's our daily look at the world of business and a notable retirement, that of Jack Ma, the founder of one of the world's largest internet companies, Alibaba, who is stepping down from his role as chairman of the company. Well, Duncan Clark is the author of Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built. So why is Jack Ma stepping down now? A lot of speculation as to why Jack Ma is stepping down today. It is his 55th birthday. It's also World Teacher's Day, and he you know, has a background as an English teacher. He has talked about his desire to focus more on teaching, on philanthropy, on the environment, etc., causes that are close to his heart. However, you know, a lot of people speculating that government pressure has played a role in, the, in this decision. Alibaba itself is a very large, impactful company for the Chinese economy. Also in areas like media, Jack Ma himself has taken on it's a quasi-political role, for example, meeting President-elect Trump even before President Xi had actually spoken to him. So the idea of how, how high-profile a technology business leader in China can be is one of the big questions. I mean, this is sort of unprecedented for, for China. What is his legacy? Jack Ma's legacy really was identifying how the Internet could be married to this private sector boom. Uh, and the, the private sector boom was sort of manufacturers in the coastal areas of China selling initially overseas and then to Chinese consumers. And Jack Ma really timed it perfectly to embrace the Internet and, and, and harness the Internet to supercharge this economic revolution that had begun. And you met him at the place where he started it all, didn't you? Yes, in the little apartment where the company was founded. And I met him in that small apartment when there were just, uh, I think, 20 people at the time. There were 18 co-founders. And people could obviously were sort of sleeping in the apartment as well as working around the clock. It was, uh, uh, you know, that classic entrepreneurial founder story. <laughs> and what is the state of the company that he hands over to his, his hand-picked successor? It's almost a machine, Alibaba, today. I mean, we're talking about handing over from one person to another. Uh, to some extent, you can't really hand over from a founder to a sort of a hired help, if you will, uh, without a big change. And, you know, Daniel Zhang, the uh, guy who's taking over as chairman, has been uh, CEO for, for some time. It's a very large company now. It's, it's worth almost half a trillion dollars in, in stock market valuation. But also, it's not just an e-commerce company now. It has expanded in a number of areas, including data, uh, technology, cloud computing, but fundamentally, it is the company that transformed retail in China and, I think, transformed the Chinese business environment by giving a face to entrepreneurship, really legitimizing entrepreneurship in a country that hadn't previously. But is he handing over at a time when things might get a bit more difficult for the company? You can argue his timing is good in that uh, you know, it's, a, it's a tricky time, obviously, with U.S.-China relations and the Chinese economy has been slowing, although... Alibaba is growing much faster than the uh, core Chinese economy, and so it's a good time for him to, to hand over the reins when the company's look, looking pretty good, given all the external challenges. And that was Duncan Clark, author of Alibaba, the house that Jack Ma built, speaking to us about the uh, decision of Jack Ma to, to step down as chairman of the company he founded. listening to the BBC World Service. This is News Hour coming to you live from London with James Kamarasamy. Calls for countries to take urgent action to mitigate climate change seem to come along as frequently as the extreme weather events which provide the clearest evidence for the argument. The first report from the UN's Global Commission on Adaptation is different because rather than focusing on reducing carbon emissions, it's all about how we can and must change the way that we live in order to adapt to climate change that is already happening and is inevitable. And importantly, it argues that such adaptations could actually bring net benefits. Here's the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launching the Commission's report in The Hague today. It is with great uh, privilege and marked by great urgency that I announce the launch of the Global Commission on Adaptation to raise the visibility of adaptation and focus on solutions. Well, the report is called Adapt Now, a global call for leadership on climate resilience. It says an investment of $1.8 trillion over the 10 years from 2020 to 2030 could yield net benefits of more than $7 trillion. We're joined now by Andrew Steer, a member of the Commission and the CEO of the World Resources Institute, who joins us from our Washington studio. Welcome 
to news hour perhaps let's start with uh, terms if we like at the beginning adaptation we hear a lot about mitigation for listeners what is the difference well, we have, first of all, of course, have to try and stop climate change. Um, but, of course, climate change is already here, and so we need to adapt. We need to get used to the fact that already temperatures have risen by one degree Celsius, and that already is hurting 500 million small farmers around the world. It's threatening a billion people in coastal areas. We just saw this week, tragically, the uh, uh, hurricane uh, Dorian. Um, science predicts that extreme weather events will get uh, more intense, um, and they certainly are. So we have to both aim to stop climate change getting worse, but we need to work much, much harder to, um, to adapt to that climate change. Where should the priority be? If we stop, we don't need to adapt, surely? Well, if we could stop, it, we, we wouldn't need to adapt. Um, but, but unfortunately, it's already happening. And even if we were to cut all uh, greenhouse gas emissions to zero right away, still in many decades to come, things will get worse. The scientists are almost unanimous on that. So um, this is not a choice of trying to stop climate change or trying to adapt. Unfortunately, we need to do both. In terms of where we start, we need to ask the question, who is being most affected? Um, and of course, it's a, it's a moral imperative as well as an environmental and an economic imperative. Those that did least cause the problem are those that are most threatened. And so uh, agriculture in Africa, poor farmers, um, up to 30% uh, declines in their yields are likely to happen, uh, where um, in, uh, insects used to die out in Celsius, temperature means they now live through the winter, and then they wreak havoc, of course, because they multiply. So what are the key types of adaption, adaptation that you're calling for? Well, the important thing is to really sort of change the mindset. For the last hundred years, as we've been doing modern planning, we've assumed that the past trends are a good predictor of the future. And unfortunately, that's no longer the case. So we really need to assume that the future is not only going to become more difficult, but actually more unpredictable. So whether you are a mayor of a city or a prime minister of a country or a village leader in Bangladesh, um, you still need to be thinking about the future and uh, and you need to ask the question who's most affected and so there are some very simple things that are happening uh, you know, crops are being changed so in Costa Rica they're producing somewhat less coffee more oranges in Bangladesh some very simple things instead of chickens there they're now some farmers are, are investing in ducks because they can swim so very very simple things but then at the other end of the spectrum massively sophisticated things so the Thames barrier for example has has lowered risk which has enabled um, enabled the financial district in the east of London to grow up and so so we we both have the relatively simple at one level to the highly sophisticated and we need a we need a really comprehensive approach and we need to have altogether more sort of uh, political engagement in this subject. Well, yes, I mean, is there a political aspect to what you're arguing? You talked about those uh, least able to cope with the changes, perhaps being uh, unfairly uh, impacted by them. Is there a sense that you are, you have a sort of a radical agenda, politically quite radical agenda here? The interesting thing is that 20 governments at the head of government level, including China and India and the United Kingdom and the Netherlands and many, many other countries, African countries, small island countries, have all sponsored this exercise. So people are worried. I mean, if you go, obviously, to small islands, I was in Fiji a couple of months ago meeting with the finance ministers of the 12 Pacific Island countries. They don't need to be told this is important. This is obviously important. But actually, around the world now, countries are starting to realize their citizens are saying, for heaven's sake, what's happening. I mean, in Florida, um, uh, there is now a, a huge sort of public um, demand for action on climate change. And so, yes, it's a political issue, but it's not a, I, it's not, I mean, it's radical at one level, but it affects all of us. It doesn't just affect um, those that are threatened by flooding in, in Bangladesh. It affects actually those who are living in the United Kingdom or, or, or any advanced country too. We're all in this. And very briefly, uh, Andrew Steele, what, what about the uh, this idea that this can bring net benefits? Do you need to make the economic argument? 
I think so. I think we really haven't been, we haven't had a strong narrative for politicians. And on the climate prevention side, we now have a very strong narrative that actually addressing climate change is actually good for your economy. On the adaptation side, most politicians have thought this is sort of rather boring, it's expensive money, and it won't yield benefits for a long time. And what we've shown that actually putting money smartly into adaptation will yield returns four to one, up to 10 to one in some areas. So this is very, very good economics as well. Andrew Steer, thanks very much. Now, the government of Myanmar is pushing ahead with preparations for the repatriation of hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims who fled two years ago after the Burmese military carried out a widely criticised operation in northern Rakhine state. Last month, a second attempt to persuade Rohingya to leave their camps in neighbouring Bangladesh failed because of the refugees' fears about their safety and their future status. Our correspondent Jonathan Head was among a group of journalists invited to northern Rakhine state by the Burmese government to view its repatriation preparations. And he found evidence that the welcome won't be as warm as the authorities are trying to suggest. Inside a prefabricated hut, not far from the border with Bangladesh, Burmese immigration officials demonstrate all the preparations they've made to process returning Rohingya refugees. There are fingerprint kits, a photo booth, clothing packages for men and women, and of course, reams of forms to fill in. They've been showing this to journalists for more than a year now. But so far, only a handful of Rohingyas have dared to make the crossing back to Myanmar. <laughs> 